we will now have the panel uh, the session on tracheostomy i invite dr arpit sharma to talk about the surgical technique good morning everyone to start i will just congratulate thiru for putting up such a great show and everything is too good right from the time management to the food and everything i must applaud thiru for that so i am talking about a relatively simple topic but i think uh, the buck stops here at tracheostomy and the things done around the tracheostomy so it's just a surgical opening in the trachea where we create a stoma at skin surface which leads to the tracheal lumen indications as we all know is depending on the like it's a obstruction or we are doing for a toileting purpose but i have broadly divided into two categories where one is having a airway pathology and one is a non airway pathology so in the one where they are dealing with the airway pathology the congenital lts or a acquired lts or maybe a cord palsy situation in a non airway pathology the most common one being a prolonged ventilatory support apart from that we will see a cns disorder neuromuscular diseases aspiration issues also however we must know the difference especially when we are dealing the pediatric age population in cases of neonates there are almost 10 tracheal rings above the sternal notch whereas after 6 to 8 years it's almost the same till adults of 6 to 7 rings above the sternal notch we must know the difference when we are doing the things electively like most of the tracheostomy should be done ideally electively but some situation when there is a emergency tracheostomy we should be prepared to handle that also coming to the tubes most often we are using the portex tubes and more and more now we are seeing silicon tubes as well we should know the indication that we are doing the tracheostomy for accordingly we can use a cuffed versus uncuffed fenestrated double lumen tubes as well always it's good practice to check the cuff before starting the procedure and keep the tip of the tracheostomy tube lubricated either with an antibiotic cream or an ointment uh most of the times in an adult population usually the 6.5 to 7 is the size we use for the females and the uh, 7.7 to 7.5 the adult male but in pediatrics we have to see according to the age of the child in premature kids weighing around 1500 grams 2 to 2.5 2.5 to 3 mm is the size as we go on 3 to 3.5 and as we have seen just prior also okay, there is a very useful mobile airway card available by cincinnati group where we can see all the things and put in the details and get a age appropriate size of the tracheostomy as well so elective tracheostomy is ideally to be done in the ot under control settings why it's important is because if it is a airway pathology we must spend some time uh, assessing the airway also because if you are doing the things right at this moment we can definitely prevent further uh, uh, worsening of the stenosis and sometime we can just reverse that as well and sometime it is not only the primary airway pathology even doing a tracheostomy can also lead to a subsequent airway stenosis so it is a very good thing to do it electively in a controlled settings and as well as add a airway assessment even preferably always before a tracheostomy if not possible soon after the tracheostomy and i will say go a step ahead if required spend some time either putting a steroid ointment antibiotic ointment infiltrating steroid if at all it's possible intubate the child before starting the tracheostomy if possible if intubation is not possible maybe you can go to for a, a lma or if that is also not possible do the adequate oxygenation and sedation for the child so that there is the least movement possible check all the instruments and the equipment available going for the steps of the tracheostomy the first step is the preparation know the indication of tracheostomy why you are doing the tracheostomy is it the prolonged intubation or some non airway pathology is there whether tracheostomy is for a short term or a long term always check for the ptinr and the platelet count also check for the age appropriate uh, tracheostomy tube size if always try to keep two sizes available sometime it may be uh, whatever size you are anticipating may not go in so you have to keep a size uh, one extra size available always consult the fam family and the parents regarding the tracheostomy care and the inability to vocalize also positioning usually we give a, a, sh a small extension below the neck so as to keep the neck extended i'll here say ki avoid Uh, too much of extension also because when you do so there is a mismatch in this uh, level of the skin incision and the tracheal incision 
when you put the child back to the flex position the skin incision at different level and the tracheal incision at different level and eventually the tracheostomy tube shaft impinges on the supraglottic part suprastomal part and eventually it may lead to a stenosis there as well sometimes in elective such uh, emergency situation we may have to do in a prone position also uh, sorry supai uh, propped up position as well coming to the most important thing is the location of the tracheostomy most of the times we will prefer doing it at the third fourth ring whenever it's a case of a prolonged intubation in cases of a laryngeal tracheal stenosis we will either go above the stenosis just above the stenosis we will prefer going through the stenosis if possible or just below the stenosis however if it is a lower tracheal stenosis will go as low as possible to the 6 7th ring level also so most of the times if at all if uh, is a laryngotracheal stenosis there always a senior should be available and they should try going through the stenosis because we are trying to save the tracheal rings available eventually if patient goes for a resection and ostomosis we want to keep as much as uh, normal rings available for further procedures this is a, a nice uh, diagram from the monier's book where is seen where how you go through the stenosis in cases and if not possible then just go above the stenosis if it is a lower tracheal stenosis so depending on that uh, usually the cricoid is the most identifiable landmark in the uh, neck so we go midway between the cricoid and the sternal notch around 2 cm below the cricoid and that's how we will know okay, which tracheal rings we are entering into because cricoid is the most easily identified also in the trachea when we are on the trachea uh we can go for a vertical incision or horizontal incision some people prefer horizontal but elective settings we will always stay with the vertical incision only uh sorry uh, in the emergency settings elective you can choose to be a vertical or a horizontal incision it's a very important step removal of the subcutaneous fat some people do it at the end of the procedure when they try to mature the stema but i think it should be done just after the skin incision it helps in inversion of the skin edges and help, uh, helps in creating a stoma when we are taking the stitches around the stoma after that we'll go for a midline dissection as we are doing in the operation theater settings so monopolar or bipolar cautery is usually available thyroid isthmus anterior jugular vein whenever encounter should be dealt with properly with this achieve hemostasis very well before opening up the trachea and always keep on palpating the trachea throughout the dissection it's just a rule for us like always after every step we will just palpate trachea even after so much of experience you may just end up going in one one of side of the trachea and go into the gutters also coming to the tracheal incision uh, uh, people follow mostly two types one is a horizontal incision and a removal of one ring and making a jock flap or taking a vertical incision the cincinnati group prefers a vertical incision uh, rest of the uh, a lot of people and especially the lozan group uh, prefers a jock flap where we will cut horizontally and cut one tracheal ring and suture it towards the inferior end of the stoma always remember to remove pretracheal fascia before tracheal incision failing to do so may lead to subcutaneous emphysema pneumomediastinum as well again it's a very important step of maturation of the stoma how it's important it will prevent infection prevent granulation very importantly if in cases of accidental decannulation it's very easy to put the tube back and ev eventually the healing after the tube removal also is going to be uh, quite easy Uh, quite uh, faster as well if you are taking a vertical incision there is a practice of taking a stay sutures also on the either side of the incision and keep it taped on the neck if at all if any accidental decannulation happens you can always pull these sutures apart and help expose the trachea for putting the tube back in it can be removed after the first tube change and it's helpful very much in the reinsertion of the tube when you have created the vento you, uh, on the trachea you will withdraw the endotracheal tube slightly you will never remove it completely appropriate tracheostomy tube is placed under vision sometimes when there is a narrow opening and you are opening in a narrow field you just uh, put the tube and it chances of a uh, uh, false passage is always there so try to always put the tube under vision position and adequate ventilation to be confirmed immediately by the anesthetist after that you will just uh, you'll inflate the cuff and uh, keep the make it a habit of uh, measuring the pressure of the cuff and keeping it between 20 to 30 cm of water 
and secure the tubes uh, with the ties around the neck in a flex position. If the patient is in ICU and under ventilation, people prefer to take stitches also. So the tube, so there's to avoid accidental decannulation. Very important part is how you dress up the tracheostomy after it. Like always uh, put either a gauze piece with the ointment or maybe use a, uh, strips of uh, bactigrass as well. That is also a very good practice in uh, ICUs. It keeps the skin a little humidified and moist also and prevents any infection. Uh, change the tracheostomy dressing twice a day and avoid soiling of the dressing by ensuring regular suctioning. Again, after removing the extension and keeping the patient in a flex position, again check the air entry bilaterally. Because in a young patient, in a young neonate or an infant, sometimes the tube length may be more and tube may end up in one of the bronchus. So it's very good practice to check it then and there only. And if at all a flexible uh, bronchoscope is available, always check the position of the tube by doing a flexible scope there on the table else. In a post-operative care, it's a routine practice to do a chest x-ray to confirm the tube position as well as to rule out pneumomedestinum or pneumothorax. Regular and gentle suctioning of the tracheal suction should be done. Uh, the practice is usually after every two hours or as required. Uh, first change, first tube change is done usually after first week. It's very important to involve the caregivers, especially the guardians or the parents of the kids about suctioning and the stoma care as well because their teaching starts there only after the tracheostomy eventually the child may go home on a tracheostomy and they should know well how to manage it well always discharge a patient with a spare tracheostomy tube also and it's a good practice to kind of teach them the tube changes as well coming to the complication part of tracheostomy what we see usually is the an early uh, uh, period is a hemorrhage subcute emphysema accidental decannulation Late we see suprastomal collapse, granulation tissue, it's rarely a tracheo, tracheal nominate artery fistula, tracheoesophageal fistula or pneumonia. So I'll just uh, touch it upon briefly. Hemorrhage is the most common thing that we encounter. Usually good practice to achieve hemostasis because before the tracheal incision. It may be usually because of damage to the thyroid vein or the thyroid asthmas. So there a bipolar cautery comes handy. If mild, after we are done with the procedure, if any hemorrhage is still there, you can manage it with a gauze dressing or a surgical. If persistent at the end of the procedure, you may have to sometimes re-explore. Pneumothorax and pneumomedicinum is not so uncommon. A little bit of a pneumomedicinum can always be there. It's a very much common in emergency tracheostomies. To be suspected if after insertion also, there is a failure to adequately ventilate. So whenever like uh, you have confirmed the tube position, tube is in the trachea, still you are not able to maintain ventilation, then always you sh the thing you should suspect is a pneumothorax. You should always ask for an x-ray. Uh, that's why it's important to meticulously remove the pretracheal fascia. Accidental de uh, displacement extubation may happen. It can be prevented by suturing the tube. If tube is displaced to the pretracheal space, might not be apparent immediately. So again, a good practice is to put a fiber optic uh, scope through it. You will always know whether it's in the trachea or not. Uh, investigate, we should, whenever there's a suspicion, we should investigate all cases of difficulty in breathing through the tube. Uh, flexible scopes really comes handy in such situations. Subcute emphysema usually can, uh, can be seen uh, many a times in cases of tube obstruction or tight closure of the skin incision or a tight neck dressing. So the first thing that should be done is remove tight dressing uh, make the even the tube also the ties also a little loose and uh, in severe cases however it can lead to displacement as well the treatment is starting the high flow oxygen and sometimes multiple punctures are also required and just pressing out the air out of the subcutaneous tissue rarely a tracheoesophageal fistula can happen uh, intraoperative damage usually happens with the posterior wall of the trachea uh, maybe during the time of the tracheostomy or maybe because of the persistent rubbing of the tip of the tube. A uh, patient will show some signs of aspiration even with an inflated cuff. If the tube is uncuffed, change to the cuff tube immediately in such situation and then re-explore the wound. A very rare complication but not unheard of is the tracheo-innominate artery fistula. Sometimes there is a direct erosion of the artery wall by the tube. So any post-op bleeding should be taken seriously. Flexible bronchoscopy should be done to examine the trachea first of all. 
just see whether that uh, any blood is also going into the trachea as well wherever suspicion is high ct angiography should be done any bleed from the anterior tracheal valve has to be explored immediately with the cvts assistance or sometimes i have seen a case where there was a ct angiography was done but uh, the tube was in c2 and there was no leak seen and these people and we we had a high suspicion of uh, the tracheo innominate fistula and the inr fellow said ki we are not able to see can we just remove the tube and see once the moment we removed the tube it was blood all over and we were not able to save the child so granulations are most frequently seen uh, usually due to infection and poor tracheostomy care treatment is a topical antibiotic topical steroid and it really works very well and sometimes a ciprodex uh, eye uh, solution also can be installed around the tracheostoma that also really works well Uh, if at all if you are not uh, able to manage it then eventually we have to remove it with the artery forceps and sos bipolar cautery change the tube as well because sometimes it's a long standing tube also cause such kind of infection suprastomal collapse again uh, uh, whenever we are doing a decannulation we should always have a look in the suprastomal area if any granulations are there it should be removed and uh, ideally it should be done in the operation theater and uh, when if at all if required the superior part of that needs to be stitched and hooked to the st- skin and uh, major may require some time resection and anastomosis also so the best is to prevent it to happen and if at all if it happens it ideally can be uh, handled in the operation theater depending on what kind of it it is uh, the late uh, sequelae can be a tracheocutaneous fistula when there is epithelization of the tract again has to be handled in the operation theater where need to excise the tract and uh, surgical excision works really well but even after the excision i don't go for a complete closure i still uh, leave a one stitch uh, kind of open and may put a glove drain kind of a thing because sometime a tight closure if it uh, done immediately may lead to a subcutaneous emphysema also so always leave some space for the air to escape tracheal stenosis as we know is a usually may happen because at the suprastomal area at the tracheostomy at the level of uh, tip of the tracheostomy as well and usually because of the poor post operative care in the cases of tracheostomy a frame deformity can be avoided by doing a surgical tracheostomy closure usually when wherever the tracheal walls are so weak and you remove the tracheostomy tube it collapses upon itself to uh, have at a frame deformity in such cases uh, it has to be handled in the operation theater where we that we suture the walls of the trachea to the skin and the subcutaneous tissue and see if at all it's holding on like that thank you so much thank you dr arpit